So, uh, all right, that's yeah. good. Thank you for that. And any announcements that you have? Uh, I'm DJing at on Friday for the Diwali party at Chuan New. So, okay. But I think it's sold out now. So if you can get tickets, please do come and say hi to me. Okay, that sounds great. It's sold out, but you have a few uh, Swift-like tickets in the back that you send on the secondary market. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. So let's get started. Uh, we have a bunch to cover. I'm going to start by going back to the OCC stuff uh, that we rushed through in the last class and there are a few things that I needed to go correct from that. Uh, first thing is, let's go back to this chart over here. I've updated the slides to correct one of the arrows in the figure. It didn't change in a big material way, but to be uh, true to what was present over there. So let's see if we can understand why this works. Remember, there were three conditions. And when a transaction is in the validation phase, it checks against these three conditions. And the best way to think about this is that the, the ultimate check that needs to happen is between two pairs of transaction, TI and TJ. And I is checking with all Js that are in the future. Right, so it's just looking at it from that direction. If everyone does that, everything works out. So the first part of that, and some of that was a little confusing in the last class because I skirted on the issue of precisely when some of these uh, transaction IDs get assigned. But the first part of that is that TI and TJ are assigned these transaction numbers so that I precedes J in the equivalent serial schedule that we are trying to enforce with this protocol. So effectively, let's start from the bottom here, case three, which is in some sense the most difficult case, but it's the arrow is from the end of the read phase of TI, which is kind of when the transaction work all ended, right? The rest of it is, can I commit and stuff like that. So TI to TJ goes in that direction. This means that the read write dependencies are all going from I to J, right? Just by that, because the write phase of TJ is gonna come way later so uh, the objects only become visible in the global database to anyone else when the write phase happens. Remember, in OCC, all the changes are being made to the local copy of the objects, right? So this becomes trivial. We can't really, from just this schematic diagram, to say anything about the other two uh, anomalies, the WR and the WW, and so for that, we are going to, in the validation phase, check that those two sets don't intersect. Okay, so if you understand this part, the rest of it follows. It sort of gets weaker in terms of the checks you have to do, because if you say the right phase follows the right phase, uh, you can basically not have to check the WW because that is implicit by the definition of that condition. So what it means is that if transaction I is getting ready to commit, it'll say, what are all the Js that I need to worry about? And there's some state kept in the system that keeps track of all the active transactions. So I will, and transactions get assigned these transaction IDs. So I knows it needs to only go check from its point on to everything that is, that is in the future. And that future, every transaction at some point gets assigned a transaction ID. And that comes from, as we talked about, transaction IDs get assigned by the simplest way is there's a global counter. Everyone does an atomic increment to that and gets a transaction ID. So I knows everyone that it needs to go and be concerned uh, about, and then it does that check. The other two checks are easier, so if you get case three, the rest of it will just fall off from that. Okay? All right? And thanks for pointing out that arrow bug from that paper. Uh, that certainly helps, but it also made sense to start from case three rather than case one, and if you get that, everything is simpler. Okay? All right, so we're gonna keep marching on. The second thing I want to mention is I've told a couple times over the last few weeks that 721, the advanced database class, is going to cover advanced transactions. That is not true. Two years ago, that's what 721 did. I know many of you are starting to figure out what to register for, uh, but the uh, earlier version of that this year in spring of 23 was all analytics, and the coming version is also going to be all analytics. Now. That means if you are still interested in transactions and things like that, if you want to pursue something, you can still do some sort of an undergraduate research project, come talk to me and Andy and we can figure 
figure that out if that's really where your heart is in. But I do want to correct if you're registering for 721, it's going to follow the curriculum of spring 23. So it's going to be all analytics. Okay. Questions on that? I know that came up multiple times uh, in questions even after class, uh, especially after last class. All right. So we are going to go and look at the rest of the OCC in uh, relative uh, quick, uh, 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 relatively quickly. So far, we've looked at that read phase. We were in that validation phase, which is what that diagram is. A transaction has validated itself and now is ready to say, I've been given the green signal to write all my stuff to the global database. And it's only when you write your stuff, all of that was happening in the local copy, will it become visible to everyone else. So now multiple transactions could be entering the right phase at the same time. And you want to make sure correct things happen. Now, I'm going to only go through it at a very high level here. There's a full-fledged paper on this that uh, I put a copy of that, uh, uh, the, the exact paper that it refers to. That was the HT Kung paper. You saw the image in the slides. So you should go and read that paper if you want more details on what I'm going to tell you next. Okay, and certainly happy to talk about it offline. So the simplest way to get correctness in the right phase is to say, we are all going to have a serial order of doing the rights. And any transaction that wants to get into the right phase is going to grab a latch in memory and say, I'm the one that's writing. Everyone else, please wait for me. It finishes all the writes, which may take a long time because the transaction may have updated a million objects. And now it has to write it out to disk. Uh, and once it is done, the other transactions can proceed. There's an advanced protocol that allows parallel writes to happen. And at a very high level, what it's going to do, it's going to play off that condition three and say, I'm doing a lot of these checks between the read and write sets. And it's going to even do a couple things where it's going to delay the transaction number assignment and the readers will not even get a transaction number. So this means there are fewer transactions to check against if you're a writer, because it's sort of like reads go free and we'll hit that theme again as we talk about MVCC, which is the bulk of today's lecture. And then even for the writers, you will go make that check happen in succession without being in a critical section for as long as you can avoid doing that. So effectively, some of the ideas that are mechanisms that apply in other places too, is if a lot of us are writing together and we, our rights could interfere with each other, if we establish some sort of an order, saying I'm going to go always, every object has an object ID, and we are always going to go from the low to the high, you can start to play games where you can start to do quote unquote unsafe stuff with the right, but not get into each other's way because you're establishing a certain order. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. I know you probably have a million questions. I'll take that offline, but there's a, you know, it takes about 30, 40 minutes to go and really deeply understand that parallel commit protocol. The main thing I want you to know is that the right phase itself, you need parallelism. And if you're not careful, all the work that we did in validation, we can't just overwrite each other's stuff, right? If TI finishes before TJ, TI's right set has to be written before TJ's because you don't want the other way around because that would basically mean that some later transaction, some newer transaction, some older transaction overwrites a newer transaction, right? So you have to follow that order. Okay. So, Optimistic concurrency control versus pessimistic concurrency control. This I do want you to understand, and uh, fair material for exam, right? Hint, hint. Uh, is when do we think one works better than the other? So there are trade offs. As with every of these mechanisms that we've been talking about, see, optimistic concurrency control doesn't do locking. And uh, as a result, it can start to do really well when locking would have become the bottleneck in having the transaction do its work. But the cost that it has to pay is that it's, oh, it's going to make a whole bunch of copies of that data set, and that's going to be expensive. As I alluded to, the transactions that are read only can actually go through without getting in the way of everyone else. And they can pass behind even writers. And this so uh, we'll see MVCC, which has similar traits of it's a mechanism, it's not a full-fledged concurrency control mechanism. It will get paired with other things like OCC and 2PL and things like that. But the same kind of things of allowing readers to go through will apply. Right? So essentially, all these copies are going to get expensive. So if I have a workload 
in which there are lots of updates happening and the updates are happening to large portions of the database, obviously OCC is going to run into trouble because it's going to have to make all of those copies. Furthermore, if there are real conflicts between these transactions, real conflicts, you can't avoid that, which means some aborts need to happen. In OCC, if that validation phase, I have to abort the work and imagine i had done the work, I'd been, I'm a transaction, I've been running for an hour, I've made a ton of changes, I go to validate, I have to throw all that work away. In the two-phase locking, the pessimistic approach, all of that wasted work doesn't happen because the first time two transactions try to step on each other's toes, we'll stop them, right? We'll stop them. Uh, the downside is you are acquiring locks all along and you have read locks and S locks and here you can kind of make readers just pass by. Okay, so that's the trade-off. And in some workloads, this is gonna be better. Some workloads, uh, the pessimistic approach is going to be better, right? It'll depend upon specifically these types of characteristics. How much contention is there and how much work do you have to undo if there's contention and to abort a transaction? I just wanna check, when do aborts happen in TPL? Is it only for deadlock? No, it can happen like a phase validation. Oh no, for TPL. For 2PL, uh, uh, aborts can happen when you have deadlocks. Yep, okay. exactly. That's yeah, I yeah. And I'm, I'm skirting a little bit. Sometimes if you have lock upgrades and stuff like that and you're trying to do funky stuff, then there might be other reasons for it. But by and large, in 2PL, the aborts will be on the deadlocks. Yeah. And cascading aborts, right? We talked about that, but let's leave that aside. But uh, there was, there was a, the other tricky situation. But the, that's where the abort caused other problems to happen. All right. We have so far assumed in everything we've been talking for about two weeks now that we have database objects that are real, they are physical, like pages and records that we are doing something with, making a copy of, or acquiring locks on. But in real life, you can also have transactions that are creating new things. We have completely skirted the issue of what happens when something is getting created, right? We've kind of pushed it aside on the side. And by and large, everything we've talked about with locking and stuff like that will work, but there's an interesting problem that comes into play. When you have creating, you have to worry about one more thing that we haven't worried about so far. Right? We talked about the different anomalies that we have, unrepeatable reads and dirty reads and all that, all, all that kind of stuff. There's one more anomaly that we have to now worry about. And that anomaly has to do with the fact that all these protocols are doing things on physical objects that are present in the database. And so if there's a transaction that's creating new stuff, you will never have seen it when I mean, you're trying to acquire a lock or making copies. So let me illustrate that with an example. So here are two transactions. Now, instead of having read-write calls, I've just put the SQL query in there, and you can kind of see what's happening there. The first SQL query is trying to find how many records are there in this uh, people table with the status uh, uh, call lit. And it's going to repeat that after a little while. But in between, a new record got created. That new record should be in the answer, but the first query is not going to see it because when it ran, that record didn't exist. When this then runs again, this exists. Now, that could have grabbed a read level lock on all the pages or records, and this would follow two-phase locking protocol if the locking was done at that granularity of pages or records and you would essentially get the wrong answer. Now, if the locking were all done at the database or the table level for this query, it would be fine. But then you're not going to have that granular locking, right? We, were, we are trying to get this granular locking to allow parallelism to happen. OK? So this is called the phantom problem. And the reason why it's called the phantom problem is, you know, here, for example, assume the first query returns 99. The second one should have returned, uh, should return, uh, uh, will return 100. And that just feels like that is obviously not serializable, but repeatable read type of semantics is basically uh, getting violated. So does that make sense? I'm sure it is not. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what exactly counts as a transaction? And you talked about this a few times before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, a transaction, you can in SQL actually put in an explicit begin call, write a bunch of SQL queries and end it uh, with a commit or an abort. You could even put an explicit abort. So that's the other case, you might have an explicit abort. Uh, or if you don't put that in your SQL assignments, you never put a begin and a commit 
in the assignments that you did so far. In which case, this database engine will implicitly put the begin at the start of the SQL query and put a commit at the end of it. Okay, unless you get aborted for all these reasons we talked about. So these are explicit transaction boundaries that get uh, put into the system. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, can I, if I understood your question correctly, can I write an application code says begin and then do a nested begin transaction? The answer is no. There are models that allow you to do these types of nested transactions, but in practice, you can only do one begin. You can do these things called save points that we talked about, where you say begin, save point, save point, save point. So when you say, oops, I want to roll back something explicitly in the user transaction, you can say roll back only to the last save point or the second last or the third last save point. Uh, so you won't explicitly nest that. Database systems can't quite do that. But it's not they can do that. There have been models that will use that type of idea in other ways. but SQL and practical database systems will not let you nest it in that way. Was there a question here? Maybe it was the same one. Okay. All right. So you get why this happened. This happened because the first transaction was locking only existing records. And it didn't see, it won't see the new record that is getting created after it has started to run. Even if you're using OCC, it's going to make copies of everything it has read. It's just going to reread from that because it thinks that's all the records that corresponded with that status is equal to lib. So OCC, two-phase commit, both of them, uh, uh, two-phase locking, sorry, will both have this problem where they will face the phantom with all the mechanisms that we've talked about so far. Okay? So we need a little bit more if you want to prevent this type of a problem, this type of an anomaly to happen. Can you think of what might be ways we might avoid this? For example, when you're trying to insert something, take a write lock on the hierarchy above it. Yeah, yeah. Instead of taking it on the top. Yeah, exactly. But the question is, how do you know that someone else is going to be interfering with you? So does that mean? So the answer was, uh, if the first transaction had acquired a table level lock, a shared lock, then this wouldn't happen. You're absolutely right. But how do I know? when I should not do that, or should I always do that? If I always do it, then I don't have as much parallelism as I want in the system. Say I S lock and then S lock on the Yeah. No, no, I get that. But what I'm saying is, if the protocol, we change that two-phase locking protocol to say, you will always grab an S lock on the table, and you will no, not do any finer granularity of locking, then you've reduced the parallelism in the system. Right, so that is not what I was saying. Yeah. The read remains the same, but whenever you're trying to insert something, you take a right lock on the pen. Got it. Okay, okay. Sorry, I misheard what you said. So you're saying when I'm trying to write something, I should grab a read lock uh, on the table, on the original table that I'm reading. Writing a new tuple, take yeah. a right lock on the table. On the right lock, but that means that if a reader is in progress, I will have to stop. Yeah, so I was just going to go to that compatibility matrix. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Otherwise, it, you know, basically, these are all the games that you can play in that the right lock will basically not be allowed, right? Because even if I have an IS lock, uh, I think it was in the previous text, so I'm just going to let it go. Uh, so that would, it would run into trouble because you are now going to, that update will not happen, right? Here, what we are trying to do is to, is to, uh, see what happens when we want to allow maximum parallelism in the system. So we don't want to take so harsh an approach, like put a write lock for even one record update, because that means I'm blocking everything off and that transaction is doing more, locking out more areas of the database than you need to. Uh, but you're on the right lines that we can do something akin to that, right? So there are, you can logically do stuff like that. And the way you could logically do that uh, and get around that is, is this thing called Predicate locking, but let's start with the re-execute scans. Yep, question. What does it mean for the set of objects? Is it mean like the database objects, not the the database objects, like records? Uh, just think of it as records uh, for now. Okay, so you're saying that we, like, we don't change like what records are in the table during the... So if you had no updates, right? Why did we start out on this path? Saying we have a dynamic database in which new inserts are coming in or things are getting deleted. I'll update. I'll allowed to have that. Uh, so far, everything we talked about, updates to an existing record is allowed. 
But if I, the example I showed you for the phantom was with an insert, same thing will happen for a delete. So if you have inserts and deletes, then you start running into trouble. And so that's kind of what we are trying to prevent. So one way to do that, there are three approaches, and this is gonna be the theme throughout today's lecture and, and the next lecture is for every little problem, there'll be multiple mechanisms, they're gonna have trade-offs. And so the first scheme is to say, I, whenever I have to go finish the transaction, I will go and reread all the stuff that I needed to read as specified by the query and check if I got the same thing. So this is easiest if you have OCC because I keep track of all the objects I've read. So when I'm done, I will go and reread it, I'm done. Imagine I'm in the, uh, the validation phase and just as I'm trying to get into the validation phase, I will go reread everything and say, whoops, is my read set changed from what I did when I actually ran this stuff? If so, then you're gonna say bad setup happened. There's the, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Predicate locking says, this would not have happened if I just keep in track of all the predicates, status is equal to lit. And anyone who tries to write that covers the records logically by the specification of the predicate, I need to do some special handling for that. So predicate locking is the first solution that was proposed when this phantom problem was detected in the 70s. But as we'll talk about it, it's really hard to do and no one does it because it's an uh, NP-complete problem. It's Boolean satisfiability for those of you who are theoreticians. The approach that end up getting used is to use an index lock and we'll have to make changes to how we, allow, we use the index to go do this locking because an index points to actual things, but it can point to ranges of things. So it kind of can simulate a predicate lock. So let's just jump into these details and see how this works. The simplest part way to do this is to re-execute the scan. As we talked about, I just go reread stuff and say, is it exactly what I saw when I read it? In that case that we looked at, the second time we go and reread that table, we'll see something different. In that case, it was an update, but if it was a delete, we will see that and we'll say, whoops, can't go ahead and do this. If I want phantom protection, I'm basically stuck and I'll have to, I'll have to stop, okay? But that requires an expensive check. That re-execute requires an expensive check going through the system. And the place where this gets used is there are, there's a subclass of transactional systems that work on data that sits in memory because practically today, you can get like a four terabyte main memory server and a lot of even big heavyweight uh, transactional workloads can just be in memory. So this in-memory OLTP is a big thing. I was just talking to some of the folks at Oracle uh, recently at a retreat that's kind of where I ran to after the class. And you'd be surprised a four or an eight rack Oracle system is what runs massive things like the New York Stock Exchange. It's not a big cluster, large memory, small cluster that runs that. Okay, and I know we won't talk about it in the advanced database class, but I'm happy to do this offline. There's a really cool paper that says transactional systems, if you add more nodes, actually get slower and you can prove that. They get quadratically worse. Unlike analytic system, where if I add more nodes, I can do partitioning and all this stuff and I can get faster. There's a huge incentive to keep fewer nodes in an analytic system because more things trying to do stuff start to e get into each other's way. And that contention and having to resolve that grows quadratically, okay? I'll leave it at that and happy to talk about that offline. So the re-execute scan works for when your data is in memory because it's much faster, right? If, it, if you're going to disk, you'd be waiting a long time to re-execute the scan. Uh, the golden way to do this is through predicate locking, which is to say every time I have a query, so I look at the where clause of the select, I look at the where clause of my update, insert and delete queries. These are the ones that are trying to make changes. And imagine I could look at all of those predicates and resolve by just looking at the predicates logically, do they interfere? If yes, I can actually go solve this problem by just looking at the predicates. And that's beautiful because I really don't need to mess around with objects and lock tables and stuff like that. I can just look at the query predicates. Now, this turns out to be really hard to do because just checking for uh, uh, overlap between the predicates because the predicates could be complex, right? You could have conjunctions, disjunctions in the where clause. Uh, turns out to be the same as a SAT problem. Obviously, that's pretty hard. Uh, and most people don't do that, though, though this was the original solution that was proposed. Uh, 
Hyper, which is a new system, uh, not new anymore, but it's a really cool system that came out of Germany, has this notion of predicate lock. And one of my students who is just graduating had worked on using predicate locks in a limited setting for OLTP, recognizing that they have a certain structure. And because they have a certain structure, you can actually do predicate locking for an important class of OLTP workloads, but not completely in a general way. Right? The general way still requires solving this SAP problem. Was there a question? Yeah, yep, you'll do that separately. And so the question, there's the other part, and this will again go maybe an offline discussion. If you could do predicate locking correctly, you may not need the other types of locks. And I'll, and you know, we discussed that in that paper, but we could only get a limited class of OLTP working, but it was a class that we didn't think could be made to work before. But in the general case, it is still super hard. That's why no one uses it. But happy to talk to you offline about that or point you to that paper. So how intuitively, how is predicate locking gonna work? you're going to have to create some sort of a structure to find out which predicates overlap. One very simple thing is to say, imagine I'm creating like a two-dimensional structure or some sort of a hierarchical structure. We'll just take a hierarchical structure here. The first query here says the predicate is simple. It's just status is equal to lit, right? I have no conjunction and disjunctions, but we know that that's what happens in real life and a lot more complexity comes in. So just sticking to the simple example, I can say everything that I'm doing is, is this predicate. So all the it's effectively like defining that range for it. And then the second predicate that comes in is a subset of that. So that's what you're trying to determine. Like what is a subset of each other, where that overlap is. And just doing it one predicate is sounds pretty easy, but imagine doing it with conjuncts and disjuncts and in the general case, that's where all the hardness comes in. But in the simple case, you'd say, okay, uh, I see status is the field. And on that, there are different predicates. Status is equal to Lee. lit is one of the predicates on status fields. And then within that, I'm a subset of that. So I can say, oh, the first query covers the sets of records that I am touching. So anytime there's overlap, it's unsafe, right? The red stuff is the dynamic database update, insert, or delete query. And you can start to make these checks. So you get this general idea that you can do this with predicate locking, but it is a very hard problem, right? So uh, uh, doing this predicate chocks and stuff. Yep, question. How many locks do you have? So in this case, I'm just showing the predicates. Ignore the lock as being a lock. It's just the predicate. So it's not like you're grabbing a lock on the predicate per se. It is called predicate lock. You're simulating that by basically saying, I'm covering this range. So you can imagine this data structure, not sitting in a lock table type of a structure, but sitting in, the traditional lock table that we talked about, but in some sort of a predicate lock table in which it is keeping track of these data structures. So it's not a lock table entity in the traditional way that we've talked about so far. Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just hold on to that question for a little bit. Uh, you could certainly view it in that way. And you can, uh, and effectively, the way it evolved is that people said, can we try to make predicate locking working and realize, oh my gosh, yeah, we are not going to prove it, uh, P is equal to NP or make the database system so slow that it can never come back. Uh, so index locking is a cheap way of doing predicate locking with a little bit of more complexity uh, than this, but it becomes practical. That's the that's short answer, and you'll su see that in a second. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, what happens if the re-execute scans don't match? Yep, you would then abort. That's correct, yep. Other questions? I was wondering if re-execute scans can be compressed. What if you insert like the first, second check to delete the first? Yeah, yeah. So what happens if I insert the object and delete the object? Assume objects have an object ID that you can hold on to for simplicity. And so there'll be some, we'll come to a version of that when we talk about MVCC. As to what happens if the same record got deleted and it got reborn again? The values are the same, but you know it's a different record. What do I do with it? So hold on to that. The mechanisms are going to be similar to what we'll just talk about in a bit. Yeah. OK. All right, so that's predicate locking. Awesome idea, very hard to do. Now we get to how people actually do it. And you're going to muck around with the B trees. OK? And immediately, I'm going to tell you that if you don't have a B tree on the predicate you're trying to protect, you can't do this. So you'll have to build a B tree on all the predicates that show up 
that you want to protect with a predicate lock. Otherwise, you'll have to do stuff like this, which is grabs things at the uh, table level X and uh, S locks to do that. So assume for now that every predicate of interest, that is, that we are trying to protect against the phantom, has a B tree on it. Okay? And so with that, we are then going to go into index locking. By the way, that's not an unreasonable assumption because OLTP workloads often tend to have updates, the where clauses in the update, insert, and delete are usually going to be along very specific keys. I'm updating the record, the home address of a customer ID. Your shopping cart application is going to have where customer ID is equal to one that you present. It's basically going to be that. So it's not, even if the customer record has 100 of columns in it, it's basically coming down on these update queries on one or two columns, right? So it's not unreasonable to say that you're going to have these B trees, okay? And these B trees also help because it helps you identify, in this case, the customer ID of interest. That's what trees do. So it kind of matches nicely that you're going to have this synergy happen with this index blocking, okay? But do you need the index to do everything we are going to talk about next? So remember now, it's been a while, more than a month, but hopefully you still remember the B trees, right? Uh, they have, at the leaf node, it looks like a sorted uh, keys. And of course, with the keys, we are pointing out to the records, right? So not showing the pointers over here, but they represent ranges. And now we know how to do physical locking. Also, we know how to read physical things in OCC and stuff. We know how to make all of this work with physical stuff. The problem is this ghost record that showed up in the example, we don't know how to protect against that. So if you know how to do physical stuff, imagine a lock table. So far, I was saying I can lock a page, I can lock a record, I can lock a, a, a table. You can also say I can lock a key in a B tree, right? So we can easily make that extension in the lock table. It's a new type of thing that is lockable, okay? So now what you can say is I can actually grab a lock on the key 14, which is in the index. That protects anyone else from touching key 14 while I'm working on it. I'll grab it as I'm scanning the index, doing my range predicate. And as I touch each of the keys, I'm going to grab, put locks around. Someone else tries to do something in that key, it won't work. Immediately, you're going to say, this doesn't solve the problem because the problem is not the key itself, but the stuff between the keys that didn't exist. So I've got 14 and 16, and someone's trying to insert 15. What I just told you won't work. So I have to also protect the gap. And there's this really cool type of lock that's called a gap lock. Okay, so I can acquire a gap lock that says whatever is the gap uh, after 14, that I'm protecting. Okay, and now we're going to do a little bit more. And we're going to do this thing called the key range lock. So we're going to take those two ingredients. We can lock keys and we can lock the gap between keys. We'll bring it home and we'll do these key range locks. So. Imagine uh, in the simple example we had where status is equal to lit, just the key lock would work, right? Because there wasn't a range. But now let's make the example a little bit more complicated and say the uh, regular SQL query, the select query was trying to do uh, read all records between 14 and 16. And we didn't want a record 15 to show up in middle uh, because that might cause that same phantom problem that we discussed. So what we'll do is we'll do a key range lock, which is, the key 14 and everything that is to the right of it. Okay, and that's called the next key lock. And logically what it says, I'm locking 14, but it's a different, special type of a lock that says it's 14 and everything that is to the right of me till a real value shows up. And if I wanted to, if my predicate was, uh, let's say uh, 12 to 16 or greater than 14, I will grab 14, 16 and everything after that, right? So I can depends on whatever range I want. And effectively, it is saying it is inclusive of 14 and exclusive interval of 16. So anything between 14 and just shy of 16, right? That's the range. Does it make sense? That's an interval lock. Uh, you know, we are, we are basically just creating an interval. Yep. Why not just get the lock on 14? Because it won't. So the question is, why not grab the lock on 14? If someone's trying to insert a new key 15, how have I protected myself? They will never see the 14 lock. They'll just go ahead and make the change. If my query was exactly equal to 14, then I would be fine with what you propose. Like status is equal to lit, and I was protecting the lit value in the status column, I would be fine. But if I'm doing a range, I will need to protect this gap. So when did you get the next 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's coming up next. Great. Uh, so there are two ways to do it. One way is to say I have a next. There's a completely symmetric way to say I might have a prior lock. Now, you will implement only one of these mechanisms, not both. Otherwise, you'll end up with deadlock. Remember, we just talked about everyone swim in one direction. So it will depend upon how am I going to access my B tree. A B tree typically comes down from the lowest key when you're doing a range. And then you typically go uh, scan the leaf from low to high. You could do a completely different way of go high to low, but most people go low to high. Whatever is that access path you have for your B tree is what you're going to do. So if you're going to low to high, you'll say my system implements the next uh, key mechanism. Right? So it's, to, it's got to match the way in which you're doing this to be, to be natural. You could make it work the other way around too, but it's just more natural to do it in one. But you will not do both. You will not do, you will not say some transactions will do a uh, prior key and some will do the next key, then you can start to run into trouble. But if, okay, so in, in, in my DBMS, let's say I implement the prior key. Yeah. It stops me from, uh, from putting something in between 14 and 16. Yeah. If you, no, no, no. If you wanted to protect 14 and 16 with the prior key, you'd have come down on 16 and did the prior to 16 to 14. Regardless, you so it's really simple. It's not that confusing. You either do the prior key or the next key locking. Okay, if you, and depending on that, you're going to set what my interval is. You're going to say, in this case, it is everything greater than 12, just greater than 12, up to and including 14, right? That's my interval. And in the other case, it would be the other way. So whichever gap you want to protect, now you can protect as long as everyone's protecting the gap in the same direction. So yeah. Is it that you, you would implement both next key and prior key? No, no, no. I just said that. You will only implement one of them in your implementation. If you do both, you'll run into trouble with deadlocks. So you pick which one you want to implement, only implement that, and then use the same way in which you protect ranges. So you shouldn't say one range, one query that wants to protect 12 to 16 is going to go left to right. The other one goes right to left. Now, don't do that. Just go all in one direction. If I want to stop uh, the no, no, you can only implement one of the two locking modes. No, if I have prior key locking and I want to stop something between 14 and 16. Yeah, uh, we just talked about that. You would do 16 and prior key. Uh, you do 16. If you wanted to also include 14, so let's take the three cases that are possible. I want everything, my predicate is uh, greater than 14 and uh, 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 include 16. So 15 and 16 is kind of, if this integer key is what I want to protect, right? Then I can basically do 16 and the gap that I want to protect in, in between. Uh, and now you might say, okay, what if I don't have, so the your question might be, can I have a next key locking like we have seen on the screen, uh, uh, screen over here and it only protects the gap and 16? Does it kind of look like a prior key? Yeah, it does, but you don't want to do that. So in this case, you might say, I'm actually going to lock a little bit more because that's all I have. So I will do 14, 15, and 16, even though 14 is not my true conflict because but that's the granularity at which I can do that. So I think that's where you're getting hung up. It's like, okay, I may be locking a little bit more than I need on the edge cases, and that's true. Okay, so to kind of do the same thing, as this example, prior to you lock 16 as well. Yes, yes. So... Yeah, exactly. No matter what you pick, it's very simple. You just pick one of those and implement that. You will that edge case that you're thinking about is very legitimate. You will have you will be locking something for a little while, but no more than one value, right? So you're okay with that. You can only implement either next key or prior key yep. or the gap lock or the key value lock. Uh, uh, the question is, would you implement? Uh, are you should you do only one of next key and prior key? Yes. Can you do gap locks and the other locks too? The answer is yes, but generally your implementation could get very complicated, so you'd probably just do one of them, right? Uh, there is a reason, and as I said, that doesn't mean systems don't do that. They, for B trees are so important, they will do all of this stuff and make it, make it work. So yeah, you could even do a pure gap lock. You could just say, I'm just gonna do 14 and gap, I can just do the regular value locks and gap locks because what we are talking about here is a composition of that. As long as you go in one direction, you can make all of that work. How do you manage the locks for these? Because it seems like each time you have insert over here, you either have to create new locks or like. Yeah, so all of these will have some representation in the lock manager, right? So you these are locks, so they will be requested from the lock manager because it has to check that. And so then the question is, what do I put into that lock manager? And it'll basically say something like, here's key 14, 
uh, it will basically talk about that interval saying it is you know 14 to 16 that i'm trying to protect and the lock manager can have different ways of representing that yeah and there are details for that again we can talk offline about what makes sense but that's not super complicated but there are some some interesting issues there too okay great I was hoping to finish MVCC today, so that will keep us here till 6 p.m. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll figure out how to adjust the material for the rest of the class. Uh, great. So the other part that we have to worry about is, can we use the fun stuff that we had with granularities of locking with IX mode and the intention modes too? Like I'm scanning a B tree, I'm reading it, and then only some of things that I read I may want to update. Should I grab the axe lock first? As we said, that will not allow in a parallelism. Everything we talked about in hierarchical two-phase locking actually beautifully applies over here because all hierarchical two-phase locking needs is some sort of a containment hierarchy, right? As you're coming down, you can say here is stuff. Here's a bunch of things I need to read, uh, but need to operate on, and that's organized into smaller sets of stuff, and I've got a beautiful containment hierarchy. You kind of have that here. So imagine I have a query that is just reading stuff from 10, including 10, up to 15, and not including 16, it can grab an IX lock on that. That's the predicate. And if some of it, after looking at the record, right, it may have got 14, chased it down, looked at something, and said, yeah, now I need to go update uh, this 14 key to something else. It can only grab that X lock on that. And some of the transaction that was getting an IX lock and that same range, but was updating a different key like 12 is allowed and compatible. It can go forward at the same time. So you can do all of this locks that we talked about in, uh, with the gap locks and the uh, prior and next key locks. You could have the lock mode also follow all the lock modes that we talked about, right? The lock modes are orthogonal to what we are locking and what we are locking that resource, if it's got a hierarchy, you can apply all of those principles inside a B tree too. Okay, so it's beautiful that that whole theory holds up here too. Again, yeah, you allow more parallelism in the system as a result. We talked about this. If you don't have an index, then you'll have to do something else, like lock every page in which stuff of interest exists and kind of use that or lock at the table level, which will be the other way to do it. But the trade-off over there is you will not have as much parallelism that you'll allow. You'll have more transactions that are blocking each other than you would with some of these more advanced schemes. All right, so, uh, so far, we've talked about everything, assuming we wanted this conflict serializable, view serializable schedule. And then we said, you know, if you just thought about the way we do that, you're missing phantoms, so we are gonna add that phantom protection. Uh, but in practice, it turns out that many times you need even weaker forms of protections. An example is I've got a database operation that wants to read all the records to build statistics for the catalogs that the optimizer can use to figure out how many records there are, what these histograms are. Remember, now again, a month or so back or six weeks ago, we talked about histograms that optimizers need to produce cost, cost to cost the plans that they're searching through. Where do they come from? So imagine building a histogram. I've got a petabyte table. I have to scan that petabyte table. It's going to take a very long time. Even if you've got a massive cluster, it may take days or hours. And so what do you do? Do you grab an S-lock on that? You will block everything else out. So what you'll do is you'll say, this transaction is OK if it sees like dirty reads and stuff like that. I'm just building an approximation structure. It can run in a very low transaction mode. Right? So that's a good example of uh, uh, how you might have these weaker forms of isolation. Okay, so essentially, we might say, I'm allowed, I'm okay, you know, don't want to get myself protected against all these anomalies we've talked about, dirty reads, unrepeatable reads, uh, 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 phantom reads, and so on, and I can get these different isolation levels. SQL has a standard where it defines these isolation levels with specific terms, and it turns out that these terms are confusing. I have a bonus slide that talks about if you really want to get into the details, the experts in the world who understand this wrote a paper saying how SQL's definition is all wrong. So we'll kind of cheat a little bit, stay with the definition. I really want you to understand that SQL has definitions, and you can actually start a transaction. When you install a database system, uh, many database systems will have default isolation levels, and we'll see a slide in that. And you can even add a transaction level in most systems 
pick different levels. Everything we've talked about is kind of serializable with what we've built up so far. Perfect world, everything is serializable, phantoms are protected against. So that's called serializable schedule. Okay, that red stuff is actually a keyword in SQL. The other one is repeatable read, everything we talked about till phantoms. So it's like, yeah, you'll get repeatable reads, all this other stuff, but phantoms you won't protect yourself against. And many database systems, that's the default level. Okay, and you're kind of giving up and saying, I want more parallelism. I know kind of what I'm getting into, I'm okay with that. Okay, read committed is where phantoms and unrepeatable reads may happen. So kind of the histogram query very likely runs at that, right? So it's like, fine, I don't care about phantoms. That's just a small change to the database. If I've read a record, someone updates it or removes it, I don't get a repeatable read on that table scan. I'm okay with it, I'm just building a histogram, okay? And then read committed is all of them can happen and you know, you're in, on your own basically at that point. Uh, and some of this, Andy pulled up this, I'm just using this example from Andy's slides, which was uh, uh, many years ago, like 2012 or something, there was this thing called Silk Roads that used to do all kinds of shady things, but the technology wasn't shady. The use of the technology for selling stuff was shady, but I think the intent for setting it up was shady, uh, but it all got shut down. And then there was one big thing that started to bring all of this down is because the behind every data every data platform or any application of any serious uh, wealth is going to be a database system. So they had a database system in which it was super easy to hack and someone figured that out and they effectively said, I can do Bitcoin transactions. So imagine I've got one Bitcoin in my account and I'm going to withdraw that one Bitcoin, but I'm gonna have like 100 transactions do it at exactly the same time. If you were run at one of the lower isolation level and didn't pay attention, all of them will go through like the debit card account, the, the transaction that we started at the beginning when we started talking about asset, right? You and your significant other are trying to withdraw at the same time. If you're not running with the right isolation level, your database system is gonna let it go. And that all started the huge collapse, right? So something like billions of dollars worth of Bitcoins, one guy could remove by just firing up the same query and just making it all go at the same time. It's not that hard. You could say begin transaction, fire my query, begin transaction, fire my query. So it's not like you have to time it too much either, right? You could put explicit begin and time it. So you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. All right. So in terms of these four isolation levels that are the ones in SQL, I'm not gonna go into the details of all of this. I'll let you look at the slides. It should be pretty manageable, but this tells you precisely what is protected against, like serial as well, will guarantee that no dirty reads happen, no unrepeatable reads happen, no phantoms happen. And as you can start to see, read uncommitted is, is like all of those may happen, so you better know what you're doing, okay? Uh, there's also a way to map these into locking protocols. Again, I'm gonna go through that at a very high level. Serializable basically says lock, obtain all the locks first, plus the index locks, and use strong strict 2PL. So all the stuff we talked about, if you really wanted that stuff, you're gonna do all of that. Repeatable read says all of this stuff till like the last 30 minutes of what we've talked about, right? You'll do strong strict, but don't have these index locks. Read committed is weird. To get read committed, if you're using two-phase locking, you'll do everything as above, except for the S locks, where after you read something, you won't hold on to the S lock, you will release it. So you're not doing strict two-phase locking uh, in that sense, right? You're not holding the locks till the end, but that means that's how you get, you know, I release the locks and I get this unrepeatable read behavior, okay? Phantom went away because we weren't doing this index stuff. And so I'll let you by yourself go through this and figure this out, but it'll map very nicely if you've understood everything so far. It'll be trivial to understand these slides. And read uncommitted says, the only thing I'll protect against is you know, writers on in, on records uh, uh, interfering with each other, but there are no S locks. I can read dirty stuff happening at any point in time. So is read committed just no locks at all? No, they're still write locks. Yeah. Why, why do you, oh, because of data races. Because of data races and stuff like that, exactly. And, and I'll point you to a paper where you can look at it in gory details and understand that. So it's not there are no locks in read committed, you'll still do the write locks. Okay, as I said, you can explicitly set these isolation levels in SQL. SQL supports that. Those are the red stuff that we saw in the previous slide is, uh, are the terms. And uh, some of them will differ in terms of when do you need to set it. 
In some systems, it's like you have to declare your isolation level. If you don't want to use the default one at the begin, in others, it can be done at the end. I think MySQL is at the end, Postgres is at the begin. And uh, you'll see, you'll have to be careful about uh, which system you're using because it's not uniformly implemented in that way. Uh, not all database systems support all the isolation levels. So Andy loves to collect details like this, which is awesome. Uh, and so this is basically, he's collected a number of different database systems and what's the default level, which is that middle column, and what's the highest level they support. And uh, as you can see, most of the popular databases that you've probably played around with or used don't start with serializable. Okay, they start one level lower. And so, you know, if you really want serializable, you're going to have to do it in the transactions and put that call in there. And some of them don't even support full serializable. Oracle gets pretty close to that, but not quite. It does something called snapshot isolation, which basically says every transaction you can imagine, I'm going to give you a full copy of the database. I'm going to simulate that, right? Imagine I check out the whole copy of database whenever I get my transaction gets to run. I get my transaction ID, and then I make changes to it, and then I put it back in a safe way. Uh, but that's called snapshot isolation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. It does not do full serializable, so it won't have all the other stuff we talked about, like phantom protection and things. Interestingly, many of the newer systems, including CockroachDB and Google Spanner, Google Spanner is even stricter, they all start with a higher isolation mode because we know that you give application programmers rope to hang themselves, they will hang themselves, okay? So it's like, yes, it comes at a cost for parallelism, but can we make the protocols better? And the prime example where someone goes even further than that, like what we've talked about in this class, is strict serializable. So far, remember we've skirted this issue of, say, let's imagine I issue two transactions at the same time, T1 and T2, or uh, I issue T1 first and then T2 right after that, right? So let's say I've just split it up right after that. Everything we've talked about, including phantom protection, says as long as the database returns this back in some order, it could be that the database serial schedule that it admitted was T2 followed by T1. All of that is still okay. Strict, the serializable stuff does not prohibit us from doing that. The Google guys wanted an even stronger guarantee for the ad system, and it's a globally distributed system spanner. And it kind of gets weird if, for example, you ask a report for saying, what are my ad impressions? And you get a report with a timestamp, and then someone else asks for ad impressions, and they don't follow the time order, right? If the second report with the later timestamp looks like it had fewer impressions, you're gonna freak out. Like, whoa, whoa, how did you go back? in that. So uh, for that, they have an even stricter form, which is called strict serializable. And that name has evolved over time. If any of you are like systems or distributed systems people, you might have heard of linearizable stuff, which has that property. But for a single object, this does it for the database, right? which may be multiple objects. And so the timestamp order of what you get back on the commit follows uh, 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 the serial schedule. The serial schedule is true to the commit timestamp, the commit timestamp when the query comes back. Again, there's a full paper on that. I won't talk a lot more about that. There's this weird thing called cursor stability, which is we haven't talked about, right? It's a weaker form. Old systems like DB2 start with that. They protect even less. Uh, so if you're using that, just be careful. And hopefully now you have enough tools to go look some of this stuff and understand it as you read the papers, right? It's like teach a person how to fish. That's what we are trying to do right now with all this transaction stuff, because it could take, you know, there are people who even to this day will spend six years and write a thesis on making this better. This is not yet done. There are ways you can make all of this better. Okay? All right, because you have all kinds of crazy things like CXL, RDMA, memory storage hierarchy, and processors are changing. So it's like, we'll keep revisiting this. So if you understand transactions or query optimization, you'll have a job for life. Uh, this is a very simple diagram. Again, I'm just going to toss it up over there where the highest form of uh, uh, isolation level is at the top. As you go down, it becomes weaker. And you can say repeatable reads and snapshot isolation don't have an arrow. They're not quite comparable. Certain things that will allow versus not. We can see snapshot isolation is lower than even serializable. Okay. And again, I'm going to just leave it at that. And this, uh, there are two more slides on this before we move on. Uh, uh, Andy did a survey asking a bunch of database admins as to what is the default isolation level in the database system. And as you can see, 
uh, uh, you know, serializable, not very popular. Okay, and read committed, uh, which is one level below, is the default as you saw in the previous slide, um, and that's the world. So you know, if you're gonna do any database -y stuff, and even if you're not gonna build the internals of a database system, you could make all kinds of crazy problems for for yourself and for your application if you're not careful about this stuff. Okay, so hopefully you're getting that through in terms of how important it is to know how these protocols work, why they work, and what you're getting in return. What are you trying to protect against? Okay. All right. So every concurrency control protocol can be broken down into the basic concepts we've talked about. You know, there's a full-fledged stuff. This is my bonus slide. If you look at this paper, which was written in the late 90s, that criticized the ANSI SQL standard, which defined these isolation levels, but they defined it in a vague way. Standards done by committees, it's like Oracle's gonna try to get its form in and call it serializable. You know, DB2 is gonna try to get its stuff in. Ultimately, it comes out in some form that doesn't look like anything that's reasonable. And this paper is beautiful. It's written by the five-star gurus who understand isolation levels of which there are only a handful on the whole planet, including people we've talked about like Jim Gray and Phil Bernstein and a whole bunch of others that talked about how the definition there is vague at times, and that leads to all kinds of problems. Is like when database vendor A says serializable, does it mean the same as the other one? You need to define it more precisely, and they do a fantastic job of doing that, end up with even more complicated graphs than what I just showed you over there, with all kinds of very precise stuff saying on this arc to that arc, this is exactly what gets violated. It's a beautiful paper. If you ever want to get deeper into all this isolation level stuff, that's a must read paper. It's a bonus paper. We're obviously not going to ask you. Uh, questions on that in the exam, but uh, think of it as an apology from my side for telling you many times that 721 will cover that, but you know this paper will definitely cover that. So happy to talk uh, to you offline about what you find in this paper if you go read it, okay? All right, next class is already here and this class is nearly over, but let's get started. Great, I think we might make up some time in the next two lectures and Andy, I will talk about and figure out how we're going to do the rest of it. OK, some really fun stuff now is multi-version concurrency control. Uh, we've talked about two-phase locking. We've talked about time order uh, protocol, which we said is just theoretical, just getting you used to timestamps. We'll start to use that today. And we talked about optimistic concurrency control, which was you know, very different, right? I'm checking out objects very much like GitHub style, and I'm checking that back in, making some validation protocol that uh, checks for conflicts. Unlike GitHub, where you have to fix the conflicts by yourself, you know, database guys are nice, they try to fix it for you with the validation protocol. Uh, and then you basically uh, start to get into this next thing called multi-version concurrency control protocol. And the best way to think about it is that it's a protocol that's going to have, at a high level, two components to it. When I change things, how do I manage that change? So far, what we've said is there are two ways to do it. One is I'm going to uh, go and update in place in the two-phase locking stuff that was implicit, and I'm going to grab a lock, a write lock, so that no one else can touch it while I go make changes there. Right? In OCC, it was like, I'm going to make copies. I'm going to do everything here. Ultimately, I'm going to write it when I go to that write phase. Right? And in there, in OCC, we were making copies in our own local space, right? And we owe all, all the transactions have their own workspace. So now we're going to start to play around with some of those ideas and then see how we can bring all of that together and figure out how we do that in the global database. So all this workspace checking out, checking in stuff is too much. And we're going to try to do all of that in the global master database. We'll use timestamps and stuff like that. And we'll keep version chains around so that we can go back and forth. And really interestingly, what we'll do is we will make the readers go by without doing much work. We will still need some sort of two parts to this. One is how do we manage the versions, the MV part? And the CC part is about we will still need something like 2PL or OCC or something like that, or TO to go and protect two writers essentially from writing on each other's stuff, but readers will allow them to go through. So what I'm going to, what we're going to look at today is based on this thesis that came out of MIT in 78 and the whole huge rich history behind that. 
And for a while, it wasn't like people were getting super excited about MVCC as a way to do these things. But essentially, every modern database now goes about and does that. And Andy has a little story about how that database that was for the, this whole idea that came out, Jim Starkley started uh, a, a bunch of companies that had this type of implementation. He's also the founder of NeoDB. And then eventually that these companies, they go and get sold a bunch of times, uh, eventually became this product called Firebase, which is still sold to this day. And uh, you can actually go to the website and uh, see all the stuff that's available. But when uh, Mozilla ended and wanted to give their new browser and the new company uh, a name, they wanted to call it Phoenix first, but they couldn't do it. Then they wanted to call it Firebird, but because this database is called Firebird, they ended up calling it Firefox. So database guys influenced Firefox's name in you know, uh, copyright infringement or, or trademark in, uh, uh, in infringement. So, uh, or, yeah. little tidbit. Okay, so what are the main ideas behind uh, multi-version concurrency control? We will set things up so that the writers do not block readers. Effectively, we'll create new versions. And as a result, what we'll do is readers do not block writers and readers can slide by, okay? We will use this notion, and you'll see that with an example in the next slide. We will use this notion of a snapshot, which is kind of what we were getting when we were doing this checking out, checking in business with the OCC kind of protocols. And it's like saying, I'm, imagine I could make a copy of a database every time a transaction started, not like literally, but logically. And effectively, I get a snapshot and I can work on it, which means others are not interfering with what I saw at the beginning. It's as if everything I did in the database was at the beginning. And then, of course, when I go to make writes, I have to go follow all these validation style protocols to figure out what the next snapshot needs to look like. But that's the whole idea behind the snapshot uh, uh, idea. And the specific there's a specific uh, name for that called snapshot isolation. If you look at that little tidbit I had in the last bonus slide, that snapshot isolation wasn't well-defined, and that paper actually defined that as an isolation with very specific properties. Uh, so if I have that notion when I'm making versions, I can also do things like time travel, which we'll see in a second. So let's just jump into MVCC as a, pro, as a, as a method. So we'll just look at a simple example where I've got two transactions, and now I've got this database. In the database, I'm actually going to keep track of the value, that value, think of it as a record, for now, and in a little bit, I'll tell you when that value is not a record uh, uh, and it becomes a column value. And I'm gonna have a begin and end timestamp associated with it. We kind of saw this already previously in the time order protocols and other stuff, right? It's just gonna say, what, when, when did someone do something to me? And when did someone end? And as you saw previously in some of the protocols, we had read and write timestamps here. It's just begin and end, which largely says, I am valid from the begin time till the end time, okay? All right, and then in the diagrams here, there's also this first column, which is called version A0. That's just to make the slides easier. Uh, think of it as essentially saying, I'm record A, and I'm the zeroth version of it. That just allows us to refer to the examples in a uh, far easier way. And if you look at the slide, I have a bonus slide from one of Andy's paper that says, here's a sample example of what an actual record would look like when you're doing stuff like this. Okay, so this is a, schematic representation of what that would look like. The begin and time, uh, end timestamps are what we'll care about mostly, and version numbers make it easier for us to refer to that in the examples. And again, these timestamps are not, could be any one of these things that we talked about when transactions were doing this. It could be a logical timestamp, right? A counter that we are grabbing, and often it's some mix of that plus an implicit transaction number, uh, and you'll see that with a couple of examples as we go through it. So here's the version number, the begin and end timestamp. Let's get going. Transaction T1, let's, assign, let's assume we are assigning transactions there, transaction numbers up front. Let's just keep life simple, right? So now the transaction number is going to be a proxy for the timestamp, okay? And imagine I just read a global counter, I read it and increment it uh, atomically, and I get transaction one, T, uh, one and two other transaction numbers. Start with the read. Read is going to go and look at the value here. It's trying to read the record A, and there's only one version of it. So it's gonna go look at it and say, it will check the begin timestamp and says, I'm one. Uh, am I allowed to read this? The end timestamp is infinity here as indicated by the hyphen. Essentially that's saying, 
Right now, as the state of the database, the snapshot, as we are seeing right now, is this value ex started at time zero, sometime in the past. And as far as I can tell right now, it's going to continue in the future till someone else does something to it, which means one can read it. It's in that range of the begin and end time. So it can go read it. And then T2 starts, context switch is over. It has to write. OK, so now is where the fun stuff is going to begin and the slight, the big differences. It's actually going to create a copy of that record in that same table. And as you'll see, it could be in the table, a separate table, and a diff table. But logically assume it's creating it in the same table. There are three different ways to do it, but they all amount to behaving this way logically. OK? I did not overwrite the old stuff. But now I'm transaction two. I need to fix something with the old stuff and say, you ended at two. So any transaction that has a timestamp less than two will read the first version. Anything that is two and greater will read the new version, but that's not visible yet. I'm not done. When I'm done and I'll put an end timestamp in it, everyone after a transaction timestamp of two will have to read this version. So the version is just evolving and it's like GitHub history on a specific file, right? Saying what was valid for what time. And it's very precise, right? You take any point in time, point to a version chain, you'll get only one version that you're allowed to read. Okay? Now we are maintaining that in this table, not in a separate workspace. And along with this, we need a little bit of additional machinery, which is a transaction table that keeps track of what's happening to that transaction. For example, if I come in and start to read the A1 value, the, one, the A1 version of the record A, I need to know is 2 still alive, or is it committed or it's aborted, because the transaction could be in an aborting phase, uh, in which case it's like it's invalid. If it's committed, then I can go and refer to that. So in addition to that number, which is that transaction number, a proxy for time in this case, I will also need a transaction table in which I'll keep track of what's happening to that transaction. Transactions start out by being active, and then as they make progress, they could go into a commit phase, or they could be in an abort phase. And that commit and abort may take some time. If it's aborting, it has to clean stuff up so it won't immediately get out of the system. It will update its status as a bot, or even if it's committing, it will commit, but it still may have some stuff to do. Uh, it will set itself as commit. So think of it as just saying, as I, a new transaction trying to access these version chains, I'll see these ranges begin and end, which will tell me am I allowed to see it. But I also need to know if the stuff that has made changes to it, if it's in that range, uh, like that number two, is it like is that transaction committed or not? And I don't want to stick that in the table there because that's happening per record, right? So that's why you stick it outside. So now our records have already gotten a little fatter, right? Every record has a begin and end timestamp and a little bit more uh, as, as you'll see in that bonus slide. I don't want to have that transaction table all be there. By the way, I still want the transaction status to be only one place. So that when the transaction changes its status, I just go and change the transaction uh, 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 table and make that change. That transaction table is, you, is basically sitting in memory, okay? All right, and we won't need the transaction table in great detail, but just want you to know that you, you need that additional piece of information to go figure things out. All right, the next operation here is a read of A, and so uh, this transaction can go ahead and read that, but now notice what it's gonna do. It's not gonna read the new version, which is not yet visible, that transaction T2 hasn't committed, it's going to read its old version because now, remember previously when that read happened for that same transaction T1, the state was 0 to infinity, so it had to just go pick that. Now it will actually encounter that version chain and say, oh, I have to pick A0 because 1 is between 0 and 2. Okay? Where does T1 get the sign 2 and T2 gets the sign 1? Yeah, if T, if the, well, so the question is what happens if T1 gets assigned 2 and, and uh, T2 gets assigned 1? T2 would have uh, a graph, below all of this is locking is happening. The T2 would be, will have locked the version that has been stamped as 2 and that would stop. Now, there are variants of this where you can delay assigning 1 and 2 still as late as possible. And again, like, ignore it if you don't get it. And in many cases, in some cases, with the specific implementation of these protocols, like MVCC is not one protocol, it's a mechanism. You can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. You could even allow the readers to go by without being registered in the system. So ignore that. But if it were two followed by one, your specific question, then uh, 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 then the 
one which now becomes two will not be able to go forward till that till the outcome of the other transaction is figured out okay all right so this case t1 reads the version that it saw before right so it's getting repeatable read the whole illustration is that because you're carving up from the life cycle of a record as time evolves it has very specific points when it changes its state so you always know at a given time and point my transaction number which version i should read there's no ambiguity about which version i should read again if that version is not visible like in this case i have to wait there is in this case a write lock that will happen on that so the version mechanism is just a mechanism you still have to have a concurrency control protocol to prevent the, the right path here's a slightly different example a little bit more complicated where you have now T1 string a little bit more. It's reading as before. So T1 starts, when it starts, it gets an entry in the transaction status table, uh, becomes active, uh, puts a read in there, doesn't have to make any changes to the database yet. But when it writes, it has to do exactly what happened before that T2 was doing. So this is like a close approximation, to the question that you just asked. And then it goes and creates that value uh, one, fixes the chain, right? The chain is fixed by fixing the end timestamp on the old version. Now you can imagine logically a single linked list is formed for this record A. And now T2 begins. T2 begins, it became active, so that it got an entry in the transaction table, uh, uh, transaction status table. And then it reads version uh, A0 uh, in this case. And that is allowed because T1 hasn't committed yet, but you'll see what happens next. It now goes to the right phase, and that will not be allowed because it has to go create a new entry in the version chain, and you can't quite do that just yet because someone is creating that uh, additional list. Uh, so essentially what will happen is that the right path is going to catch it or the objects as it happens, and you'll basically go and stop it at that point. Okay. Question. What signals to the transaction two that it needs to solve? Uh, transaction, yeah. There's a lock on A2, like a physical lock. You can imagine that's the simplest mechanism. And when T2 wants to write, it says, does someone have a write lock on it? So you still need to protect the chain that is getting updated with locks. So MVCC is just maintaining versions. You'll still need a two-phase locking type of protocol, for example to go protect that. But what it gives you is that it's going to allow uh, the readers. So now, for example, if someone were like this stuff over here, right? This stuff over here, where I was just reading stuff, the write came in, I could still go through. Right, if I'm just doing read write stuff, the writer wouldn't go, I could go through because I made a copy of stuff effectively, like the OCC stuff was doing, and I got that uh, parallelism in there, okay? What's the reason we need to store the end times as well? If it's always going to be if the beginning time or the next one's always going to be the previous one, or is that not always the case? That it's basically a logical way of making that chain happen. So you're saying, can I skip the end timestamp? But then I would have to imagine I'm trying to figure out is a zero version that I'm allowed to read. If I didn't have two and I'm transaction one, I'll also have to read the next thing. It's basically forming a singly linked list. I'll have to read the next entry in the linked list, perhaps an I/O to go figure it out. So that's the trade-off you're making here. So I sort of wanted to ask if you repeatable reads can then have different values because some transaction can come in, commit, and now you're no longer able to read the older version. Yeah. If the transaction that comes and commits, it will not. Okay. So just wait for it for a little bit. We are not going to. So if T2 came in, and this is like similar to the question where T2 became T1, what happens and is two gonna read that? Uh, 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 and, and there are, uh, it'll have to go and figure some of that stuff. So just hold on for a, for a little bit and then we'll get to that. And if I don't answer it, then ask me again. Yeah, uh, as I said, you know, we'll ignore the transaction status table. I'm just putting up there for completeness. When you do the full protocol, and I can point you to a couple of papers where it actually is important to have that uh, because you need to understand what's happening to that transaction table. And there's more technical stuff that happens. Sometimes the end timestamp is, is, uh, is a dual representation. Think of it as a union type. 
between being a timestamp and being a transaction ID, like the higher order bit will decide that. And that allows you to say, I'm not a real timestamp yet. I don't have a timestamp yet, but I am identified right now by my transaction number. So there are all these little tricks that you can play uh, with that. And the, those happen when you do actual implementations. Yep. Yeah, the write write will uh, will get blocked, and read write will depend upon how you're trying to implement that. What the concurrency control protocol allows and doesn't allow. Just think of it as a mechanism that allows you to do other things and gives you this nice property of saying, "I get versions that are maintained inside the table, and I will still have my locking protocol." So, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go all the way up to the very end, and we'll come back to it. Uh, but there's a whole mesh of this. You can take the multi-version, the MB part of it, and then combine it with all kinds of things with it to get a whole blend of things with it, okay? So again, as I said, this will go well beyond everything we can cover in the four minutes that I have to cover 50 slides, but we won't do that. Uh, I just want you to understand what the version mechanism means, the chain mechanisms means, what it means to access it and data structures associated with that. And then we can talk offline about these different uh, sets of protocols. And there's also a bonus slide that I have that talks about bonus means won't be material for the exam, but answer all the questions that you're asking. And I'm happy to take questions offline. What is in this data structure? What does a record structure look like? This is one of Andy's paper. It's a beautiful paper. I'd recommend reading that. And then there's a hackathon paper that actually has a very simple protocol. It came from Microsoft's, uh, and it showed how to do MVCC along with SQL Server, which is an on-disk system. So Hackathon is an in-memory system, as we just talked about, and has a beautiful protocol that is really simple. And it's optimized even further than what we'll talk about for the in-memory case. And I had a chance to work with some of the guys at Hackathon. It was, I don't think I contributed to any of that stuff uh, besides the experimental section, but I learned a ton from them. So all the questions you're asking make sense. All I want us to go and cover uh, today is to think about that multi-version part and all the data structures and other things that we'll have to go worry about to make that happen, okay? There are different combinations of making all of this stuff happen and they'll give you different ways of combining all of this stuff and all the isolation level mess and stuff like that, okay? All right, so going back to versions, uh, the MV part of it, uh, we are going to address one more issue, which is, the snapshot isolation stuff, I already alluded to as we looked at that uh, picture about different isolation level, saw snapshot isolation level was one level lower than the serializable level. So what was it missing? It is missing something called the right skew. Okay, so this is one more anomaly that you need to know besides the uh, ones that we've talked about, you know, repeatable reads and uh, 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 dirty reads and uh, uh, phantoms and stuff like that. So we, right skew is the following. Uh, and this is also beautifully explained in that paper that I flashed as the bonus stuff in the, pre in the, in the uh, previous lecture's material. So imagine I've got a database, uh, and this is an example that Jim Gray used to use and cite to explain people in like 30 seconds what right skew is. Uh, I will probably take three minutes because he was way smarter. Uh, but here's the example. Imagine I've got a database of marbles and there are two black marbles and two white marbles. We'll finish this slide and stop, right? So I promise I won't have you here till six o'clock. And transaction one wants to change all the white marbles to black and the other transaction wants to do the other. If I just did snapshot isolation, I will make a copy. I will make a copy at the same time, perhaps. And then the first transaction will change its copy to uh, flip things over to be all black. Uh, the white marbles to black and the black marbles to white. And what you'll end up happening when you put those things back, the conflict is only have the first transaction only changed the uh, uh, bottom two, and the first transaction only changed the top two marbles. And so the diff that will merge is going to basically be that state. Right? And that's obviously wrong because it's not serializable. Uh, because if transaction one had happened before transaction two, you would end up with all white marbles or the vice versa would be all black marbles. So right skew can happen and uh, snapshot isolation, uh, basically if you just take it in this literal way is going to end up with this right skew. And where we'll pick up is get deeper into this multi-version concurrency protocol in the next class and we'll go and start uh, play, uh, working with it. 
shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. Y'all ain't nothing but gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 will send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs> 